Hello, everyone, and welcome to Tuesday Tea with the Stat Man. Ladies and gentlemen, I am your host, Vaughn the Stat Man, and thank you for joining another episode of my podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to first start off by asking, how is everybody doing? Are you guys all right? Check on your family, guys. Make sure your family is okay. And if you don't have time and you're working hard, take time to at least make a phone call to your family. You don't know how everyone is doing. Guys, don't just send text messages. Hear their voice. Get on video chat. Make sure everybody is good. How y'all pets doing? Are your dogs and your cats all right? All right, ladies, so let's get right into it, guys. So today, I'm drinking lemon ginger. That's my tea of choice, guys. I like this tea right here, guys. I don't know if you can see it. Now, I'm not sponsored by them or anything, but I do drink this tea. I love it. So, guys, let's get right into it. So on this episode, guys, I got a great show in store for you guys, guys. First, we're going to talk about Caitlin Clark's first four-game schedule and was the WNBA a little too harsh on her, giving her this schedule. And next, we're going to talk about the NFL schedule and some key matchups that a lot of people are looking forward to see. Then I'm going to talk about the Oklahoma City Thunder, how they were the youngest number one seed and was their season a success. And then last, I'm going to give my views on the NBA playoffs and what is expected of the Boston Celtics. All right, guys, so all that and more, so stay tuned. Get into Caitlin Clark. All right, so Caitlin Clark is a new WNBA phenom, guys. This woman has the type of talent that can take the WNBA to the next level. Now, the WNBA decided to have her play with New York Liberty twice and to play Connecticut twice. These are two of the top defenses in the WNBA. Guys, if you have someone that can take you to the next level, your meal ticket, so to speak, wouldn't you want to set them up in a position where they can succeed right away? I'm watching this like, wow, you actually going to have this lady go up against the two toughest defenses. And although in her last game against New York, she did put up 22 points and she had eight assists which is great, but wouldn't you want it to be easier? You want her to come out and get 35. Look at this play right here, guys. Okay, she makes a three-point shot. That's the good. But then look at this screen set. You don't want to see this in the first place. What if that screen would have hurt her and now she's done? She could have messed the shoulder up or something. You want this later on in the season. Now, I can understand that gamble because they're like, okay, we're going to put Caitlin Clark up against some of the top talent, right? Some of the top defenses. So we're going to see if she can hold her own. Like if she go out there and she put up 30 against New York and get a win, but that is difficult. That's like in the NFL with Caleb Williams. You don't want Caleb Williams to start his first game at home against the San Francisco 49ers. You want to showcase Caleb Williams in a way where he can actually succeed. You want to have him play a much easier schedule. So with Caitlin Clark, I wish they would have did a little bit different with her. Had her set up for an easier schedule, but hey, that's what they did. And to me, she's showing up okay, but she struggled her first two games. Against New York, she did fairly well. So I think the WNBA, y'all dropped the ball on Caitlin Clark's first four games. All right, guys, so the NFL schedule has been released, and you have Lamar Jackson and the Baltimore Ravens going to Kansas City, and then you have Jordan Love going to Philly to face Hurts and the rest of that Eagles fly, Eagles fly crowd. This is going to be a pretty good opening week, guys. Let's get right into it. So Lamar Jackson and the Baltimore Ravens, they venture to Kansas City week one to start the NFL season and play Patrick Mahomes in his house in Arrowhead. Now, the comparison is Lamar Jackson is 1-3 in in the regular season against Patrick Mahomes, and he's 0-1 in the playoffs. So is this a big rivalry? No. Lamar Jackson hasn't been successful against Patrick Mahomes. That's what the numbers say. Now, let's look at the difference in the two teams. And this is a great matchup week one. Now, the Ravens can probably go in there and win because nobody knows what each team will do. And I'm going to tell you why. Last year when the Ravens played the Chiefs, the Baltimore Ravens had clearly the best defense. I'm talking hands down best defense. It wasn't even arguable. They had the best defense. You look at the Kansas City Chiefs, they had a great defense. They actually stopped the pass extremely well. Now, Baltimore had a bad game plan. The Chiefs could not stop the run. Baltimore ran the ball like six times. They threw all of these passes. The Chiefs was like, hmm, they get scared when they play us. 
I'm going to tell you what I see when I see when Lamar Jackson and the Baltimore Ravens play the Kansas City Chiefs. The Baltimore Ravens, they have so much fear of the Chiefs. This is how you know when a team has your number and when a team has you rattled. If you have a game plan that you have done since the existence of your franchise and you play a team and you change that, the Ravens have always ran the ball well, play good defense, throw it to the Titans over the middle, take a deep shot every now and again. That's the Ravens system. We're going to run this 32 times. We're going to play smash mouth, punch you in the mouth, see if you can hang in the fourth quarter if you still have energy left. They played the Chiefs and was like, oh, my God. We're playing Patrick Mahomes. We got to put up 40 points. And they just came out and they panicked. They was throwing the ball over, all over the field. It was just terrible, guys. So when I look at the two, Lamar Jackson has more rushing touchdowns. Of course, that's obvious. Patrick Mahomes has more passing touchdowns. But one thing that I can say where they're kind of equal, Patrick Mahomes has a 66% completion percentage over his career. Lamar Jackson has a 64% completion percentage over his career. And I'm going to tell you why this matchup is so big. This year, these teams are extremely evenly matched, and you got a little bit of a revenge factor. Last year, the Kansas City Chiefs didn't really have a deep threat. They solved that issue by picking up Hollywood Brown, Lamar Jackson's friend and former Baltimore Raven. He is going to be fired up. You still have Kelsey. You got Rice. They got a great running game. They got a great defense that can stop the pass. They got a great interior run stuffer in Jones. They got him re-signed. So the Chiefs is going to be a handful. Now let's talk about the Baltimore Coming to this matchup, guys, they're not too shabby on the defense as well. They re-signed their defensive run stopper in Matt Abuke, and they also got the young kid. Clemson. Remember that name, guys. He is going to step up for Patrick Queen, and you're not going to see any kind of letdown. And we also still have Roquan Smith. We got both of our safeties. So we got, I think we got the best safety duo in the whole NFL. Yes, I am a Ravens fan, as you can see behind me, the Ray Lewis pitcher. Yes, I am a diehard Baltimore Ravens fan. And we also got a great running game. We got Keaton Mitchell. Remember, he got injured last year, the speedster. And we signed, choo-choo, Derek Henry. And what do the Chiefs have a problem with? Stopping the run. So I think the Ravens has a pretty good advantage in that department. And then you can't forget, Bateman was one of the best receivers in the entire NFL at creating separation. So without Odell Beckham being there, the Ravens now are going to be able to throw the ball to Bateman as he was one of the best. Go look at the film. He's top 15 in the NFL in getting separation, but he didn't get the opportunities because Beckham was there, Flowers was there, and you still got Mark Andrews, who's going to be 100% healthy, and then you got Likely, who is going to get a lot of those reps that Beckham would have got. So I think it's going to be a great matchup, guys. I say the Ravens go on and win week one, but in the playoffs, might be a different story. Hopefully the Ravens can change around their fortune. But from what I've seen, as long as Patrick Mahomes is the starting quarterback for the Kansas City Chiefs, the NFL, you have a problem. So here's a look at Caleb Williams in practice, guys. Look how easy the ball just comes off his hand. And I know it's not going against any defenders, but look how effortless he throws these balls. Look at it going to Moore, to Allen. It's just coming out so easy. The guys don't have to reach. It's hitting them exactly where they want it to go. So the NFL is doing this guy a great service. So let's get into the breakdown. So the NFL is setting Caleb Williams up to succeed right out the gate. Unlike the WNBA did with Caitlin Clark, they have given this young man a chance to win. He's opening up against the Tennessee Titans. This team is not very good on defense. He'll be able to throw the ball on this team. The skill set that he's mastered. This is his best skill set is throwing the ball. I watched him in practice. This guy just doesn't miss. And you give him more. You give him Allen, who is one of the best route runners. Komet, that is going to take the top off the defense in the middle. And then Swift, who is a, just a lightning fast running back. If he breaks a tackle, he's gone. I think this team is going to do well. Now, he's in a tough division. He got to go against the Lions and he got to go against the Green Bay Packers. But the NFL got it right. I thought the WNBA should have done this as well. Now, you want to know the main reason why the Chicago Bears let Justin Fields go? I'm going to explain to you. Very simple. The reason why it made sense for the Bears to move on from Fields. This was such a great move for the Chicago Bears is because they're getting Williams on his rookie deal. Now, you've had seven QBs in the past that win Super Bowls on their rookie deals. Look at the list. You had Flacco, Brady, Mahomes, just to name a few. 
you can look at this list. So this gives the Bears the best chance. They picked up a very top talented guy. They spent money and got Allen. They went and got Swift. They already started upgrading the defense. So this gives the Bears about a four to five year window to have this quarterback on a less expensive salary. He's not making 50 million a year yet. So now they can really go out and compete. This gives the Bears the best shot to knock off the Green Bay Packers, to knock off the Lions. So the the NFL got it right, and the Bears got it right by drafting Williams, by giving him an easy game to start the season, and the Bears saying, hey, let's get this guy while he's inexpensive, and we can go out here and possibly bring a Super Bowl title back to Chicago. Celtics roll 4-1 over the Cavs. Get into the Cavs on the road against Boston. Series ended 4-1, not the way the Cavs had hoped. Jared Allen got hurt, guys. Garland didn't really give them anything. Mitchell was putting up 30 points, and it still wasn't enough. Now, look at Boston. They outscored the Cavs 542-504. to That's how the series was never really close. The Cavs only scored 100 points two times. And Brown, he averaged 23-6. and six. Tatum averaged 26, 10, and 6 assists. And White even averaged 14, 4, and 4. And then Horford had the big game 5. Holiday had two big games. They had all five of their scores could score. Then they had guys coming off the bench. Pritchard, who was chipping in with three-point shots. So the Cavs never really had a chance. So they did actually have a pretty good season. They got out of the first round. So next year, they got a lot of hope. So hopefully next year, the Cavs can add a piece here and there. And then next year, hope, hopefully, Jared Allen will not be hurt and they can fare better. But Boston is moving on. Dallas advances 4-2 over OKC. Yeah, so OKC actually loses on the road and they lose the series four games to two. But I got to say, you got to tip your hat to OKC. They were the youngest number one seat in NBA history. And everybody's going to talk their junk saying they had a bad season. I don't, dis I don't agree with that. I believe they had a great season. But this series was turned around when Kyrie Irving brought a winning culture to Dallas. He took a step back in his scoring. He became probably the best defensive player for Dallas. And he showed Luka how to actually win. I want you to see this, this shot. This is the shot in game six that I believe won this for Dallas. Doncic hangs blocked by Jalen Williams. Loose ball, shot clock at two. Irving has to put it up, falling away. The three around and down. All right, guys, so as you can see, when they needed the shot, Kyrie Irving made the shot. Now, he did get a little lucky because it bounced up in the air and went in. But when he needed to, he made the shot. And guys, let me just say this. I'm going to give you a stat that also won this game. Guys, I'm looking at my computer right now. P.J. Washington was the absolute stud in this series. He had 19 points, guys. That was the pickup that took them over the top. And also, the difference in the game, I'm going to tell you why they won. Gafford had seven rebounds and Lively had 15. That's 22 rebounds. That's 22 opportunities that they gave their team. And if you look at Holmgren, Holmgren is the big guy who is supposed to get the rebounds. Holmgren had three rebounds, guys. Then you had Williams had eight, and Shea Gildress had eight as well. So that's the difference in the game. And the bench scoring was 24 to 15. That was a big difference in the game. But what I saw was that Luka Doncic went from scoring about 34 points a game to 25. He was still getting the rebounds. He was getting about 11, but he got eight assists. And Kyrie, even though he didn't average a lot of points, he did average about roughly 15 points. He was at 14.8, but he had roughly seven assists, which actually was 6.8. But the seven assists, guys, he started defending. Watch when Kyrie was on any of the opposing team's players. He shut them down. And he scored when he needed to. So the difference was that Kyrie brought in this winning culture. He is also a champion. And also, Kyrie is undefeated in closeout games. So you got to tip your hat off to OKC. They put up a phenomenal fight. But Dallas won, and Dallas is now moving on. The Pacers upset the Knicks 4-3 in a shocker. Little film study as to why Indiana advanced. Look at this quick pass to Siakam. Swish. There's nothing there for Halliburton. Pass to Siakam. That's called team ball. Look, he drives into the paint. Nothing there. Kicks it out the turn in the corner. Three-point shot. Wide open. Watch this next play, how Halliburton doesn't force it. As soon as he gets it, he sees that Nimhart is ahead. He passes it. This is one of the main reasons why they won. So the Indiana Pacers takes the series four games to three. 
in a shocking, shocking series, guys. But what I noticed in this series, guys, is it was a major difference in coaching philosophy. And what I noticed is that each game, you saw the Indiana Pacers adjust. So in game one, Halliburton took six shots, and they got blown out. The coaching staff said, you know what? Halliburton, we know you love being our point guard, but we need to shift. And we need to allow Nimhart to be the point guard, and we need to facilitate. And then they started exploiting matchups and mismatches. So then they said, okay, we have to get more than one body on Brunson. Because they knew, it's just like, anybody ever saw when Muhammad Ali fought Foreman, and he did the rope and dope, and he would just sit back on the ropes, and he let Foreman just punch, 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 and then he ran out of gas. I believe the Indiana Pacers did the same kind of philosophy. They said, you know what? They don't play a lot of guys. They play six guys, maybe seven guys. If we keep wearing them down and we keep running fast, Thibodeau is not going to change his philosophy. And then they felt that as the series went on, they were gaining a significant advantage. And then Ananobi got hurt, and that just changed the whole realm of how this series went. And the way you can tell that you overwork players was you started seeing a bunch of the knick-knack injuries. You saw Josh Hurt Hart get hurt, right? You saw Devin Chenzo in Game 7 get hurt. Hartenstein got hurt because they were playing too many minutes. So, and then another factor that I saw was the way Indiana moved the ball up the court. So when Indiana, when the Indiana Pacers inbounded the ball, let's say they get it to, to Halliburton. If you saw Neesmith above the the half court line, they pass it to Neesmith. That's three or four dribbles that Halliburton would not have to dribble. Now, let's look at the Knicks. When they inbounded the ball to Brunson, they started picking Brunson up full court. Neesmith was picking him up full court. McConnell was picking him up full court. Once he got the ball, he should have been looking up like, who is above half court? Oh, there's DaVincenzo. Let me get it to him. He didn't do that. He kept dribbling. And you saw as the game went on, his shots were harder and harder. His legs started to go. And then he would come up. He would, it would be two guys there. He would still shoot it. And Brunson doesn't understand when a guy is hot. When I watched Halliburton, they realized Halliburton was hot. How many shots did Halliburton shoot in the first quarter? Of the last three games, when he was hot, they kept giving him the ball. When you saw Davincenzo was hot, Davincenzo was hot, and then they went away from him. And then when Brunson would go up the floor, he would get the ball again. Then they finally realized it, but it was kind of too late. But they realized, the Indiana, the Indiana Pacers realized, Siakam can't be guarded. And you saw Siakam have his best stretch of the playoffs. He had three straight games over 20 because they realized we have a significant advantage. And Anobi tried to come back. He gave five minutes, tipped my hat to him. He did his best. But they said, Hart, we don't think you're 100%. Exploited the mismatch. If Indiana would not have done that, if they'd have said, you know what, Halliburton, we're going to keep letting you be point guard. We're going to just keep our same philosophy. We're going to run up fast. You just give it to a shooter in the corners, and we're going to keep shooting these three-point shots. They would have lost to the Knicks. But they changed philosophy. And they got guys off the bench involved. Toppin played a good amount of minutes. Shepard played minutes. I'm looking. Shepard played minutes. Toppin played minutes. TJ McConnell played a good amount of minutes. They they played a lot of guys off the bench, guys. Jackson played minutes off the bench. But this is the difference in the game, guys, and the scoring. All of the starters were in double figures. The lowest scoring starter was Turner with 17. Neesmith had 19. Siakam had 20. You had 20 from Nimhart and 26 from Halliburton. Let's look at the Knicks. And Anobi only played five minutes, so you can't count that. Hardenstein had two shots, guys. The center position is the guy who does all the dirty work. And some of the things that the center does doesn't show up in the box score. But this guy was getting you 10 points all season long. And now you don't give him any shots because he missed his first shot. You should have been doing pick and roll with him. And you do the pick and roll. You roll to the right side of the rim. He cuts down to the left side of the rim. And if his man rotates over to you, you throw the lob pass. You get them going early. Go back and look at how they did Siakam. They got him down low. Easy shots. You, you watch TJ McCullough with driving the lane, getting Turner easy. I mean, dunk the Turner half. Siakam getting easy shots right around the rim. You had Topping cutting to the rim, getting baskets. They was cutting to the rim. Everybody was involved. So at the end of the day, Tibbs didn't change his philosophy. Indiana did. So the Indiana Pacers are advancing 
for the Eastern Conference Finals. Timberwolves win 4-3 to three and advance to the Western Conference Finals. All right, guys, so the Minnesota Timberwolves advance to the Western Conference Finals, beating the Denver Nuggets 98-90 to on Denver's home floor in Game 7. Now, in this game, the difference in the game was that Minnesota had allowed Denver to only score 90 points. And that's amazing because Denver is a very, very good team. But this is the difference in the game. I'm going to show you some numbers, guys. All right, so you look at the Denver Nuggets, and only two of their starters were in double figures. You had Jokic put up 34. You had Murray put up 35. Porter? Porter only amassed seven points, guys. Three straight games going under 10 points. Gordon, who had been hot, only got five shot attempts, guys. And Jokic, again, was off from the three-point line. Now, they took over 33-point shots, didn't really do too well, and Minnesota also took over 33-point shots. But I'm going to show you the difference. In bench scoring, Denver got five bench points. The Minnesota Timberwolves got 13 bench points, guys. Anthony Edwards, the phenom, the future of the NBA, in my personal opinion, he went 7 for 24 from the field. But this is where he impacted the game the most. Since his shot wasn't falling, he ended up getting seven assists. Jaden McDaniel was hot. They kept feeding him. Jaden McDaniel was three for four from three point line. Towns was one for six. Conley was three for five. He was also hot from three point line. And Edwards was two for 10. But this is the difference. I want to let you know about when you play these kind of games, guys. If you've ever played basketball, and I used to coach basketball, I like to see whether or not we can win the free throw battle. I don't care if we shoot more three-point shots than you, because if we win the free throw battle, that means we were more physical. So let's look at the three-point the three point line. As I stated, both teams had about 30. So that's kind of even. Nobody really won that, right? Now let's look at the free throws. Denver didn't really shoot a lot of free throws. They had two of their starters even shoot free throws. You had Jokic had six attempts and Murray had five. Guys, that's 12 attempts. That means that you're shooting a lot of long-range shots. Now let's look at Minnesota's free throw attempts. All right, so you had McDaniel had seven. And Gobert had nine. That's more than the entire starters for Denver. Then you had Towns with six. Then you had Conley with, even Conley had two, guys. And then Edwards had two. Then you had four free throw attempts coming from the bench. That's the difference in the game, guys. When the game got tight, remember, Denver was up by 15. Everyone thought the game was over. I was like, wow, Minnesota might be in a little trouble. But they started attacking the rim. They started forcing Jokers to shoot long-range jump shots. They, they started forcing all of the guys to shoot shots with a hand in the face. McDaniels was the difference in this game because he took Porter out. Guys, look at Porter was off the entire series. Once they put McDaniels on Porter, that changed the series. Porter went 3 for 12 from the field, 1 for 6 from three-point line. He got 9 rebounds, 0 assists. You had Jokic, the center, had 7 assists. And the point guard, Murray, only had 3 assists. Pope had 3 assists. So that tells you the ball wasn't popping. It wasn't being passed around. And that is why Minnesota is advancing. Now, Minnesota was already more athletic. They had more talent, and they had more length. Jokic had to fight through three seven-footers. He had to fight three towns. Gobert decided to step up. Now, he didn't get the rebounds, but what I did see was Towns got 12 rebounds. Even Towns had two assists, guys. And you had four assists from Conley. Conley had eight rebounds. See, the Minnesota Timberwolves, guys, when you miss a shot, they don't give up a lot of second-chance opportunities. So that's the difference in the game. Minnesota came out. They played a more physical style. They forced Denver in the, in the really tough shots. They made Denver shoot with a hand in their face, and it didn't work out in Denver's favor. So now Minnesota is advancing to the Western Conference Finals, ladies and gentlemen. It's time for the Eastern Conference Finals, and here are my predictions. All right, guys, so we got the Eastern Conference Finals is here, guys, and you got the Celtics, the number one seed, going up against the sixth seed, Indiana Pacers. Now, both of these teams play a very, very fast pace. You got the Celtics. They're coming in at 122.5 points a game in the regular season. And the Pacers was 120.5 points in the regular season. 
Now, this game is going to be very challenging for the Boston Celtics because they do not have Porzingis. The Celtics are going to struggle with the size of Turner and Siakam. Now, Jason Tatum, he did struggle in the first series against the Cavs, but he still managed to average 24 points a game. Jalen Brown came in averaging 23 points a game. And with the Pacers, once Siakam realized that he had a matchup nightmare against the New York Knicks, he started to score about 20 points a game. Now, this is going to be a little bit different because Tatum actually is a lot taller and more physical. So Siakam is not going to have a clear advantage, but Turner has a clear advantage over Horford. I think Holiday, depending on who they're going to match him up with, I think that the Pacers have a great shot. They have more size. They're fast. But this daggone Celtics team is extremely tough. And I think that when it comes down to it, I think the Celtics have too much firepower. So my prediction is Celtics in seven, four games to three. All right, guys, so it's the Western Conference Finals is here. Let's go. Hey guys, so the Western Conference Finals is here. You have the Dallas Mavericks going up against the Minnesota Timberwolves. And this game is going to be decided down low. You got Towns and Gobert going up against Washington, Gafford, and Lively. And you also has, have Nas Reed that's going to come off the bench for the Timberwolves. The key is going to be, can Washington contain Towns? Because I think Towns is going to be able to get to the hole. I think he's going to make three-point shots. So Washington is going to have to stay out of foul trouble. He had that issue in the last series. So he's going to have to not get into foul trouble because if he gets into foul trouble, they don't have another guy at his size that can make shots. Next, you got the, the matchup with Luka going up against Jaden McDaniels. Now, Jaden McDaniels, for those who don't know him, he is a guy with a seven-foot wingspan. He's about 6'7". And if you saw in the last game, he took Michael Porter completely out the series. He's going to have his hands full. I'm assuming they're going to put him on Doncic because I don't think that you're going to put Conley on Doncic because he's not tall enough. I don't think you want to put Edwards on Doncic, so you're going to put McDaniels on him. I think Kyrie is going to guard Edwards because he's typically been guarding the score and I think Kyrie can stay in front of Daniels I mean I think Kyrie can stay in front of Edwards and then the last matchup guys is gonna be Conley I don't know who's gonna guard Conley he is in a very he's a very efficient three-point shooter and Conley is getting everybody involved for him to be a guard he's getting rebounds but I just think Minnesota's height is just too much I think Gafford's gonna struggle Gobert now doesn't have to roam away from the rim when he was guarding Jokic, he had to go out to the three-point line. I think he's more physical. He's going to block a lot of shots. Towns now can be out there spacing the floor. I think it's going to be tough for Dallas. So I predict Minnesota to win in seven. I know some of you will probably wonder why Jared Allen didn't play after game four. This may be why. Some Cavalier members were frustrated. Jared Allen refused injection in his rib to try and numb the pain. Let's talk about it further. When you was wondering what that injection was that Jared Allen didn't want to take, it's a shot called Toradol. Now, Toradol is an anti-inflammatory that helps the numb pain that can get your athlete back on the court so they can be dunking and catching NFL touchdown passes by your favorite players or running through walls or breaking tackles or dunking or whatever it is they do in their sport. Now, I only cover NFL and NBA, but let me give you some of the side effects of Toradol. Okay, so... More common is swelling of face, fingers, lower legs, ankles, and or feet, weight gain. Less common are bruising, not at the place of injection, high blood pressure, skin rash or itching, small red pox on the skin, sores, ulcers, or white spots on the lips and mouth. They're in rare cases. Abdominal and or stomach pain, cramping or burning that is severe, bleeding from the rectum or blood bloody or black tarry stool, bloody or cloudy urine, blue lips and fingernails, blurred vision or other vision changes. I think that's, they don't, athletes need their vision. <laughs> and then burning, red, tender, thick, scaly or peeling skin. So ladies and gentlemen, can you now understand why Jared Allen didn't want to take this shot? Have any of you guys ever heard of Toradol? If you have, or if you had a Toradol shot, 
Put it in the comment section. Would you take toward all to get back to your job? If you was an electrician or a construction worker or a truck driver and your knee was sore, would you take a shot of toward all to get back to making your money? Would you take that chance? And I just read you this. Now, I want you to, to hear this interview with Aldridge. He used to play for the Portland Trailblazers. I want you to hear him, Matt Bonds, talk about their experience with toward all. I don't know if y'all remember this. Tordal was like, yeah. So you took that sh you go run through a wall. When that sh wore out, man, you feel like knees, your yeah. you know what I'm saying? That Tordal your stomach yeah, up too. So as you can see, man, these athletes, they like to compete on the highest level and they want to get on the court because they don't want to let their teammates down. And sometimes they have to take injections. Sometimes they have to get anti-inflammatories and sometimes they take Toradol. But this is something that can affect them long term. And Jared Allen, who I commend, was like, no, you're not putting that crap up in my body. I'm going to heal like a body is supposed to heal. I'm not going to go out there. I can have a fractured rib. And I go out there and I play through the pain. Then they break it. And I'm still running around. And that fractured rib could, punct could have punctured his lung. I mean, that's worst case scenario. But you never know. Guys, when you have an injury and you haven't had a chance to get an x-ray, I don't know whether he had x-rays or whatever, but you don't know what was wrong with Jared Allen. But I know he didn't feel comfortable enough to put it into his body. Now, you just heard from NBA players who said that, yeah, you get the shot, man, and you like the hawk. You can run through the wall. You can do this. You can do all of these things. But the long-term effects, man, you heard what they said. When you came down from it, your knee pain, your shoulders, so you probably were worse off. Yeah, it made you feel good at the moment. But later on, and you don't know long-term effects, guys. Whenever you put any foreign substance in your body, guys, that's not from the earth, it could affect you in an adverse way. So, guys, I, I don't know what some of these athletes want to do if they're fine with it. But I know Gary Payton had an incident. Gary Payton, he actually plays for the Golden State Warriors. And while he was in Portland, he had to take a Toradol shot. He had just had surgery, so he wanted to be on the court. He was like, man, if I'm at 50%, that's better than no percent. So he took Toradol. He did confirm that he didn't take an injection. He took it orally. But I'm quite sure he had pressure on him to take that. So when you see your NFL players and they get hurt, they run into the tent, they're probably getting a Toradol shot. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to get your opinion. What is your opinion of the Toradol shot? And if it was your son or your daughter out there playing, would you be comfortable with them getting a Toradol shot? Thanks for tuning in, guys. I am Vaughn the Stat Man. Thanks for tuning in to my third episode of Tuesday Tea with the Stat Man. Guys, leave your comments. Guys, tell me what you like. Tell me what I can do better. And until next week, Love you guys.